Hi, everybody. We've got a uh, room full of people here, Deb. You want to unmute? Yes, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And we have Louise Harrison this evening, who is about to uh, give us an update and a wonderful presentation on the envisioning process, which uh, has been taking place for over the last 18 months. Um, and it's all about the future of Plum Island, what um, community members and environmental groups and um, government officials and a whole bunch of other people came together to um, work on this envisioning process and uh, Louise is going to tell us all about it and um, what uh, sort of um, recommendations have come out of um, all of that work. So again, I'm Debbie O'Kane. Um, we have both North Fork Audubon and North Fork Environmental Council hosting this meeting tonight. For those of you who may not have heard of us, we are two local environmental organizations. Both organizations have been around for almost 50 years now, uh, trying to protect what we love here on the North Fork and of course with Plum Island included. So, um, <clears throat> Just to give you a little introduction to who Louise is and what her background is, um, Louise uh, currently serves as a New York Natural Areas Coordinator for Save the Sound. She's a conservation biologist who has served in federal New York State and Suffolk County agencies, as well as in leadership and consulting positions for not-for-profit environmental organizations. She has led task forces and community coalitions in protecting open space and co-chaired a broad community movement that saved Stony Brook's last forest. She also worked in Stanford, Connecticut as the US Fish and Wildlife Service liaison to the Long Island Sound Study, where she concentrated on stewardship of Long Island Sound's ecosystems, habitat restoration projects, and invasive species control. Louise has extensive field experience working in Long Island's coastal communities and natural ecosystems, and has received numerous awards for open space preservation efforts. She served for nine years after being appointed by the New York State Assembly to the commission that created the Long Island North Shore Heritage Area. In 2009, she was awarded the Star Award from the US Fish and Wildlife Service for her leadership in Long Island Sound stewardship. So Louise, we are so lucky to have you um, working on this project and serving in the capacity that you um, are serving in. Um, once again, um, our two organizations, North Fork Environmental Council and um, North Fork, uh, North Fork Audubon have been working closely with Louise and many, many, many other organizations um, as part of the coalition to preserve Plum Island. And North Fork Environmental Council actually uh, serves on the steering committee, which um, has been very much involved in the strategic planning. So I'll let Louise take over. There we go. I'm gonna jump in real quick. Uh, we're gonna have a Q&A uh -huh. at the end of all of this. And um, while you're thinking of it, please put your questions into the chat box. Just hit the, the chat balloon at the bottom of your screen and put your chat questions in there. Um, and we'll be uh, asking those of Louise at the, during the Q&A at the end. Um, so uh, I guess without further ado. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Mark. Yes, I'm Louise Harrison. I serve as the New York Natural Areas Coordinator for Save the Sound. And just a word about Save the Sound. Um, that's an organization based in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, with offices in Mamaroneck and South Hold, New York. We fight climate change, save endangered lands, protect the sound and its rivers and its tributaries, and work with nature to restore ecosystems. Um, I just muted my phone. You may want to mute yours if you haven't done it already. And uh, I happy to begin the presentation as soon as Mark can bring it up on the screen.
Go back a slide, Mark. I'd love to. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll begin the presentation now. I want to point out that this uh, beautiful artwork and a lot of the artwork you'll see on the slides um, was done by an uh, artist in East Hampton, Scott Bluedorn, and we're, we're very grateful for his participation and his beautiful work. So um, let's assume, because I don't know all of you who are on the, uh, on the presentation on this, in this meeting uh, this evening, um, if you're all familiar with Plum Island or not. So I'm gonna briefly give you a rapid overview and uh, I'll start with where Plum Island is. So we'll go to the first slide. We will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no buttons that are doing it. One second, please. Wow. Sorry. Go ahead. All right. So Plum Island is uh, located about a mile and a half off of the eastern tip of the North Fork of Long Island, right off Orient Point. We're zooming in here so you can get a better look at it. Some people say the island is a shape of a pork chop. Um, might be. Um, it has a diversity of natural communities on it, a very wide diversity. If you look at the bottom and you see some numbers comparing Central Park to Plum Island, they're comparable in size. But here Plum Island has a majority of native species. Um, 32 of them were brand new, never known to be on the island uh, prior to 2015 by the New York Natural Heritage Program, which surveyed in 2012, uh, pretty much using the literature and then went there in 2015 to do field studies. So um, next. They also were able to compile a map showing the wide variety of habitats on Plum Island. There are 25 different ecological communities known um, and identified on the island. Some of the more significant ones are um, marine eelgrass meadow, um, maritime bluffs, maritime beach, um, maritime dunes, and uh, maritime grassland. Uh, but there are many others and this map just separates them out to show you which ones they are. A natural heritage program found rare plant species on Plum Island. And we've only just begun to learn about the 96 acre freshwater wetland on Plum Island. It's remarkable to look at from the sky or on foot and uh, the scientists would love to get in there and spend some more time finding out about its riches. One of the more remarkable facts about Plum Island is that they keep finding more bird species there. And as of now, 227 different species of birds have been found on, Plum, have been sighted at Plum Island. Now to put that in perspective, there's only about, uh, I guess, uh, more than 950, 990 species uh, in North America. I don't have that exact number, but I do know that 227 is between 24 and 25 percent of the total bird species in North America, north of Mexico. So if you think of all the habitats that exist in North America, le reaching all the way up into the Arctic, including Alaska, um, all of Canada, New Brunswick, Newfoundland. To think that a quarter of them can be sighted at an 822-acre island in the New York metropolitan area is remarkable. That alone is plenty of reason to want to save Plum Island. One of the most favorite features of Plum Island are the harbor seals that haul out on the rocks 
in the winter. Uh, you can see them there just about eight or nine months of the year, but of course they concentrate in January and February and March. And it's the largest seal haul out area in New York and one of the largest in southern New England. The waters around Plum Island are equally diverse and amazing. In the fall of 2019, Save the Sound through the generous donation from uh, an anonymous donor was able to send scientific divers out into the waters around Plum Island to begin studying the benthic communities. Those are bottomland communities in the water, under the, under the water around Plum Island. And they found amazing coverage of every hard surface down there, primarily these enormous glacial boulders that had dropped and are sitting on the bottom and are acting like reefs. They said there wasn't a, a single square inch of those boulders that was not covered with some form of life, including these anemones, but also including bryozoans, kelp, uh, corals, and there were fish species uh, circling around them as if it were a coral reef. The Plum Island's not only known for its wonderful biodiversity, it's also known for its cultural heritage and its history. The Plum Island Light, um, which was fully operational in 1827, is still there and needs restoration, but it's on the list of uh, national, the National Register list of historic places. Uh, there is a functioning light that stands next to it now that's more modern up on some scaffolding, but um, it's a favorite thing that you can see from, Plum, from Orient Point or fr as you go by on the Cross Sound Ferry. The, re the remains of Fort Terry are also on Plum Island. Now, this was a very important fort on the east coast of the United States. It was established in 1897, around the time of the Spanish-American War. And even though no war broke out locally for us to be concerned about, the building of forts continued across the entrance to Long Island Sound, and Fort Terry was one of them. People who study historic forts have told us that it remains one of the most significant forts to be found on the East Coast because it is more intact than almost any of the others. Many of the others have been vandalized and not repaired and not interpreted. But because of high security at Plum Island, vandalism has been minimized and there are many features of the fort that remain. So there are, is a large community of people who are interested in military fixtures as well as our nation's history in general, who would like to see uh, Fort Terry restored, or at least what can be restored, uh, to be restored and interpreted for the general public. But what most everybody's heard about, of course, is the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. And that has been operating there since the early 1950s, studying animal diseases that can affect our agriculture and are incredibly important to our economic health here in the United States, as well as abroad. They study foot and mouth disease, which is a devastating illness of cloven hoofed animals, and they have developed a vaccine there. So the Plum Island Animal Disease Center itself is of historic significance. Veterinarians come from all over the world to pick up the vaccine and to study diseases, animal diseases there. And it's state-of-the-art facility, highly regarded scientists, um, and soon will be moving to another state. And this is what's going on. We have a problem. In 2008, the secretary, meaning the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, which owns and operates Plum Island, 
was told by Congress that it should sell the island at a sale, a public sale, and move the facility. And at the same time, a new facility was authorized to be established in Manhattan, Kansas. Basically, Plum Island was put up for sale. People jumped into action. I'm fast forwarding through some history that some of you may well know, um, but for others, I'm getting to the crux of what our visioning was all about in the last few months that Debbie mentioned and what's been going on uh, to create our new plan. So about uh, 2010, the Preserve Plum Island Coalition began to come together. It started as a small group of the primary environmental organizations that you would normally think about on Long Island. And as of now, we have 114 regional and national organizations as members of the Preserve Plum Island Coalition. Some of these organizations are quite large in and of themselves and have many members. One of the organizations, the Endangered Species Coalition, itself has 900 or more organizations in it. So you can see there's broad support for preserving Plum Island. And you can see a list of these members if you go to the website shown at the bottom of that slide. We went to Washington in 2017, not only because we weren't getting the kind of traction we wanted with repealing that law that Congress had passed to sell Plum Island, but to find out why we were having difficulty with that and to, and to talk to the congressmen and uh, their staff members. And we heard from several staff at important committees where several bills had, I wouldn't say died, but they sort of got stuck, um, bills to repeal that 2008 law. And the basic message to us was, we're not in the business of holding on to land that the federal government's not going to use anymore. We're not going to use Plum Island anymore. If you want us to not sell it, tell us what it is you do want. Show us what you're talking about. So a couple of the organizations, mine, Save the Sound, and the Nature Conservancy, um, did some fundraising and were able to hire a consulting firm called Marstel Day. And Marstel Day has expertise in um, the transfer of government properties into conservation status. So we thought that they would be very helpful in giving us some guidance. And we began a process we called Envision Plum Island. We had three workshops that were formal, but we had many additional meetings with people in government um, at the state level, the federal level, local level, county level, um, many individuals. We received a great number of questions from people that they were curious about and they felt that we needed to answer before we could come up with a unified vision. And every time we were able to bring some more material and information to the table, more questions developed. So it was an iterative process. And fortunately, after, as Debbie said, 18 months, approximately, um, we were able to come up with, well, these are some of the sessions you can see. We were able to come up with a plan. Now the plan that we'll um, be telling you about tonight is based very much on some work that was done in 2013 by the town of Southold. And boy, are we grateful for what the town of Southold did. The leadership of, of a Southold Town Board member, Al Krupski, who's now with the uh, Suffolk County Legislature, was significant. And now the entire Town Board wants to save Plum Island. But they all believed and worked with the planning department there that Plum Island should be zoned. Now that's unusual for a federally owned property because local zoning has no effect on federally owned properties. But this town was prescient and they realized that at the very moment 
this island might be sold into private hands, they better have some zoning in place so that it could guide future development or future uses of the island. And so they did a study and they presented the study to the planning board and the planning board made a recommendation to the town board and they came up with two zones that were applied to Plum Island. The PIR district there you see in Lavender is the Plum Island Research District. And the green zone you see is the Plum Island Conservation District. And if you've never heard of zones like that before, it's because they're brand new. These are unique, thoughtful, and amazingly useful new zones that the town of Southold now has in their zoning code and that were applied to Plum Island. So they will be in effect and in force should Plum Island ever fall out of the hands of the federal government. We used this zoning as a basis for all of our future planning. And as a result of all the meetings we had and all the, the information we were able to gather and based on the zoning, we were able to come up with the Envision Plum Island report. And we have two versions of it that you can see online. The brochure is mostly pictorial, featuring the artwork of Scott Blue Dorn and some wonderful renderings by an architectural firm. And the full report, which is 72 pages, is much more detailed and gives you a lot of the background, the methodology, and how we were able to uh, come up with our ideas and what the unified vision is in the region for the future of Plum Island. And here it is, succinctly on one map, Plum Island Preserve. This is our concept. You may recall that zoning map and you may see that there are some shapes on this map that loosely follow that but we've broken up Plum Island into two additional districts. And the additional ones are for areas that we think are so sensitive that they should not include um, any use by the general public. But I don't wanna talk about what Plum Island can't be. I wanna talk about what it can be. Plum Island Preserve would protect incredible nationally significant ecological resources. It's going to help us learn about cultural heritage and our nation's history. It will promote economic sustainability. Jobs are needed in the region. Jobs will be lost when the Plum Island Animal Disease Center is no longer, and we need to keep jobs here. People will have new opportunities. The people in the region will have a park, will continue jobs in research, and there'll be great benefits in education and recreation. So we see it as an opportunity zone. So let me talk about the conservation district at this point. This is where we're not just talking about a preserve, we're talking about preserving biodiversity. And in that zone, we would also be preserving cultural heritage and history, as well as jobs. We see public access as being essential in the conservation district, because with public access comes understanding, and with understanding is a chance for stewardship. And we do want to love Plum Island. We want to take care of it, and we want people to be aware of its resources but we don't want to love it to death. So we do look toward controlled public access. And I'll have more about that later. But we see that the kinds of activities that could take place in the conservation district would include passive recreational opportunities like wildlife observation, potentially, archae uh, potentially archeological studies, sensitively undertaken, perhaps with ground penetrating radar so that you're not actually digging into the earth. But we want to know more about Native American culture 
and uses of the Plum Island by the people who lived in this region for 10,000 years. We, of course, want to see some historical interpretation, not just about Fort Terry, but the times before Fort Terry. But certainly Fort Terry offers a great deal of opportunities for learning about our nation's history. There would be research zones in the conservation district, and these would be the areas that we would think are so sensitive they should be off limits to anybody other than researchers and their students. And we see opportunities in this district as well to undertake some ecological restoration, particularly in areas that have become overrun with invasive species. One example of the use of Plum Island are our geologists who in this particular foray are out about to go down and look at the amazing bluffs there that are over 70 feet high. Um, they found fascinating evidence of how Plum Island was formed and, and um, Brett Bennington, for instance, at Hofstra University has lots to say about his theories about Plum Island's formation. Any geologist you'll talk to waxes eloquent about Plum Island. It's a fascinating place. But you may have students and, and researchers who need to stay overnight. And we're not looking at any kind of long-term residence on Plum Island. That would not conform at all to this town's zoning. But perhaps one overnight with a small dorm and a small classroom would be appropriate. One of the buildings that used to belong to Fort Terry, that's still in pretty good shape, could be restored relatively quickly for a use like that. Now the research district is the part closest to Orient Point. It's the zone that the town um, put a line around for that, the Plum Island Research District is about 125 acres. And they're suggesting an academic campus there for either industrial or some other kind of research. The Long Island Association, which is Long Island's biggest business group, like an umbrella group, stated as a priority in January of this year that Plum Island should be part of the Long Island Research Corridor. And so where most of the elements of the research corridor like Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, um, the Genome Institute in Manhattan, and uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. There's a whole string of amazingly important uh, research facilities and institutions between here and Manhattan. Um, whereas they are attracting funds to expand their research, Plum Island could be seen as an opportunity zone to bring in new research. And the kinds of things that our stakeholders thought would be most appropriate for Plum Island would be research in the areas of renewable energy, biotechnology, looking at um, cybersecurity of the power grid. Those kinds of studies are already underway there. Uh, climate studies or ecological research. We also came to the conclusion that whoever is holding the research district and operating there would be best to provide resources for the management of the island, including providing ferry access to Plum Island. We expect that um, the ferries that are also for sale when Plum Island is put up for sale um, would be owned by the new operators in the research district and available not just for employees, but also for tourists and day visitors. Again, we want tourism to be sustainable. And one of the ideas that people came up with over and over again was reuse of the historic Plum Island Lighthouse. It's of course very attractive, it needs to be restored, but wouldn't it be a great place for a bed and breakfast? Um, a place where people could come and perhaps pursue the arts. There's, there are other examples of that. 
we also recognize that this is at the moment geographically located within the research district. So we would expect there would have to be some easements established across the research district to allow people who are getting off the ferry, visiting the lighthouse, to be able to get to the conservation district to the east. And in the research district, there are structures that we think should be reused. The administration building right now is the newest of those structures. We believe it's easily re, uh, reused and adapted for the next set of jobs that come to Plum Island. It has auditorium space. We might possibly have a museum there, but what the town seems to prefer and what we got a lot of support for among stakeholders are putting a museum at the ferry dock over at Orient Point. I'll talk about that in a moment. That um, back in the, re in the conservation district, again, using some kind of a structure for uh, researchers, perhaps um, further field studies, and keeping uh, some jobs at Plum Island after the research center leaves. Uh, the Animal Disease Center now is providing about 400 jobs. That's what we understand. We're not positive. Um, about half of them come from Connecticut every day, and the other half come from South Hold, Shelter Island, and Riverhead, mostly South Hold. So those of you who are North Forkers, probably know someone who works on Plum Island or used to work on Plum Island. Almost everybody I've spoken to does. And there's a concern about what's going to happen to these high quality jobs. How do you get to Plum Island? Well, as I said, there will be these three ferries that are part of the package that the Department of Homeland Security is planning on um, selling. Um, right now, these ferries do transport workers, um, but we think that uh, it would be really great to have day visitors join the workers on these ferries to get to Plum Island. And that dock in Orient Point is key. It's right next to the Cross Sound Ferry dock. So it's easily within walkable distance from there. And we see it as a way to get to Orient Point from Connecticut um, and people who are already coming to, to uh, the North Fork. So it need not draw hordes of additional people coming through the North Fork from the West. It can easily take people who are coming from the North by ferry. So that's one way to look at reducing the potential for additional traffic congestion. But we also think that the, there could be a museum at the Plum Island Ferry Dock. And that's something that the town has been anticipating and working into a new zoning category called Marine 3. And they have um, indicated that they'd like to have a museum there at the Ferry Dock. Now that could also be a place where there would be a ticket office, which could limit the number of people on a daily basis who go to Plum Island. That could be where people would work who would set up the research opportunities in the conservation district. It would be the place for controls on visitation, but it would also be a great place for interpretation of Plum Island and its history, its resources, and to start getting some excitement um, in people. It could be a place where lectures are held, where there are exhibits, um, and it could show how Plum Island is part of an island chain that extends east to Great Gull Island, Little Gull Island, Fisher's Island, and, is neighbor, and its neighboring Gardener's Island to, the, to its south. So, um, we think there's great potential at the, at the Orient Point uh, ferry dock. 
I mentioned earlier that there was this consulting firm we worked with and why we hired them. Um, they really do have a lot of expertise in the kinds of transfers um, that can take place between the federal government and other entities when the federal government no longer wants a piece of property. The problem right now is that there's a law in place, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, that says that Plum Island shall be sold at a public sale. And a public sale is an auction, and that means the highest bidder would get Plum Island. That's not an option we would want. The highest bidder typically is someone like a developer or someone who would want the island all to themselves, perhaps, or to build a golf course, which is, was also proposed um, by a person uh, who has a lot of golf courses. We know that government agencies in New York or any other level of government cannot bid above fair market value. So they would be excluded from bidding in a public auction beyond a certain point, which is more confirmation about why this would go to the highest bidder and not to the kinds of entities we're looking at. But here we, here's the point. If we can get that original law repealed, saying that it should be sold at a public sale, then we can go through a process that's typical. And the typical process for federal properties is already codified. It's done over and over and over again for federal properties all over the United States, former military bases, Department of Energy facilities, all kinds of facilities the government has decided they don't want anymore. And there are conveyance opportunities within that uh, formatted code that already exist. And the two that would work best, we think, for Plum Island are public benefit conveyance and a negotiated sale. Let's go back to the public benefit conveyance for a moment. This is of particular interest. This would be perfect, we think, for the conservation district. We could see a transfer of the conservation district of Plum Island to New York at little or no cost as long as New York State would promise and would ensure that that area would be used for conservation purposes, for a park, for historical interpretation purposes. And a public benefit conveyance also could be used. Um, can we go back a slide? Um, a certain kind of a public benefit conveyance could also be used in the conservation, in the uh, research district if the state of New York wanted to dedicate it to education and public health uses. That's a little more narrowly construed, however. Go ahead. So it gets complicated. Um, it, if you do a negotiated sale, which is something that we see would be appropriate for the ferry property, um, there you would have to pay fair market value. But the good news is that while we were going through this process of envisioning Plum Island and talking to the 200 and more people that we did talk to, um, the Nature Conservancy also got very busy and hired a nationally known appraisal firm, real estate appraisal firm, to take a look at Plum Island and what it could be valued at. What is the fair market value of Plum Island now that the zoning is in place, remember, if you remember the timeline here, in 2008, there was no zoning on Plum Island, and the federal government seemed to have some high and mighty ideas on what they could do with Plum Island and the amount of money they thought they could bring in for it. They also thought that money was going to help them to build a new facility in Manhattan, Kansas, 
Well, that was separately funded, so they didn't need the money for that. In the meantime, zoning has devalued Plum Island. So it would not be as expensive to buy Plum Island if New York had to put some money into it, which by the way is our favorite option. We would like to see the state of New York take Plum Island and use it for conservation and research. Again, we need a repeal of the current language in order to do this. But this entire plan, if, should you ever desire to go through the 72 pages of it or open the chapter of your choice, brings it all together and shows how it can be done. We prepared the plan with Congress in mind because we want them to repeal that current language that's been still sitting in on the books since 2008 and later updated by Congress. But the other audience was the state of New York. And we would like New York to read this and understand that we think we've figured out a lot of the obstacles and how to get over them. And we know the amount of public support that we have for this. This did not come from Save the Sound and the Nature Conservancy alone. This came from the region. We think our plan is feasible. We know it has the broad support. And we know that Congress and New York can make it a reality. We need to find their will. I won't make you read this, but there are a number of bills and um, actions that are potential, uh, potentially capable of reversing uh, the fate of Plum Island in a good way. Um, there are two standalone bills that don't exactly match, but they're quite close, one in the Senate and one in the House uh, that would repeal the 2008 language and the 2012 language that suggests that proceeds of Plum Island should go to the Department of Homeland Security for a brick and mortar building in Washington, DC, which um, personally I have to tell you feels like a sacrilege. Um, but anyway, those, those, we have these two standalone bills. Um, it's very hard to get um, New York and uh, Connecticut senators' bills um, through the through the Senate right now. They have been stuck in committee. The House bills continually get um, unanimous support, but right now, um, without a match in the Senate and a signature by the the the, uh, the president, they're not really moving. Uh, so we went through the appropriations process. We had some limited success last December where we got to put a hold on the marketing of Plum Island for the remainder of the fiscal year, which ends at the end of September. So we've got you know, a few more days on that until the end of September of this year. Um, we're working on appropriations again this year, hoping to get something through there. But here's the thing, with this presidential election, we're more likely to get continuing resolutions when it comes to the budget. And that basically means that the budget will stay the same until after the election and possibly until the new administration, whatever, it, whoever wins, um, pulls the, uh, the budgetary uh, work together again. Uh, it's very typical in these kinds of election, year, well, we've never had an election year like this before, but it's very typical in election years that continuing resolutions are passed and uh, appropriations bills are stalled. So we're a little stuck here. However, you can go to preserveplumisland.org and right on that front first page, you will see a chance where you can write to Congress and you can write to Governor Cuomo both and continue to highlight the need to protect Plum Island. We need to keep the drum beats rolling. But here's something that can come up that's coming up very quickly. Here's your next opportunity if you'd like to get involved, is to come to the online South Old Town Board meeting 
on September 8th at 4.30 in the afternoon and support the application of the Marine 3 zone to the Plum Island Ferry parcel at Orient Point. It's a simple matter. We don't know that anybody's really opposed to it, but we'd like to see this come home for a landing. Right now, that Plum Island Ferry parcel is zoned for extensive use. It's, it's now zoned Marine 2. And that allows all kinds of activities that we think would be adverse to the future of Plum Island and makes it very attractive to people who might want to control Plum Island. Keep in mind, whoever does have that ferry parcel could easily control the access to Plum Island. That's where the two acre deep water port is for the ferries. Um, it's a nine acre parcel that is dedicated to Plum Island. It should stay that way. And the good news on that is the Department of Homeland Security agrees that it is essential to Plum Island and that it should go when Plum Island is transferred, it should also be transferred simultaneously. But let's protect that parcel. So putting this zoning on there where it is effectively would dedicate the parcel to transport to and from Plum Island, period. And possibly a small museum in one of the existing buildings. I've given you an overview. It's a bit lengthy. I want to thank you for listening to this long presentation. Um, I want to I'm not going to mention all of these funders, but we could not have done this work uh, in this region without the help of these funders that helped save the sound and the nature conservancy. Um, this is a way that you can get in touch with any of us who were leading the uh, envision process. Um, Greg Jacob is the Nature Conservancy's uh, lobbyist. He, he lobbies in New York and in Washington. I invite you to look at the brochure and the report at preserveplumisland.org forward slash envision hyphen report. And I welcome any questions that you may have about Plum Island or about the envision process. <laughs>